first of all, my name is David Nally. My contact information is uh, up on the screen. Uh, feel free to send me an email uh, or berate me on Twitter if you vehemently disagree with me. Um, so I've kind of set the stage. What I hope to do uh, today is to do a mix of both theory and practice on setting up Apache Dev Cloud and doing that with Apache Cloud Spec. And uh, so some things are going to get uh, 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 far away from technical details, and then we'll dive back into details at, uh, at other points. Um, <coughs> but I've got a couple of questions for you, and this is uh, this particular tutorial is best done interactively. So if you want to see something, uh, check off the say up. If you want to, uh, uh, if you don't like. Um, content, feel free to disagree, feel free to ask a question uh, and interject, uh, no need to wait till the end. Um, so, but I'm curious, why are you here? Anyone want to volunteer? Yes. Okay. A anyone interested in doing something that's not test dev? This, uh, let's call it a private class. What, what are you interested in doing? Okay. Um, I'm actually surprised how many people want to do that and want to use a science tool. Is anyone here who's been sent here to because uh, uh, someone at their company has decided that they will have a cloud strategy and they kind of see things in a different light? Okay. Um, <coughs> I, uh, I gave a similar course in Los Angeles uh, a year or two ago. And a guy from a very, very large defense contractor runs up to me and says, hey, I'm here and uh, I just want you to know that you're gonna be setting the, uh, uh, the strategy that this very large defense contractor is going to use for their cloud strategy. And I said, what? He goes, well, my boss, his boss's boss told me that we have to have a cloud strategy. We have to have it in two weeks and um, I saw this particular thing and said, I'm here to take advantage of it. Um, I will be defining that strategy for the first 12 months of training. And uh, I personally think that's doomed to failure. Um, if I'm the only source of truth that you take home, um, I'm flattered, but you're, you're, uh, you're woefully unprepared. Anyone using AWS today? Anyone using other public cloud providers? Okay. Um, I'm actually surprised. Uh, so for those of you who aren't, who say you're not using AWS, does that mean that no one in your company is using AWS? Ah, okay. Um, one of the things I've found in the US is that um, a lot of the companies are, um, say they're not using AWS or any other public cloud but uh, the people doing the expensive work is massive outlays to uh, Amazon, and they just can't imagine where they're going. So, um, uh, as a matter of fact, in the US, my experience has been that they have really decent cloud IT, or particularly if they're a tech-related company, um, they are using AWS more than they are uh, developing their own business systems. So. So anyone doing private cloud today? Am I right? Yeah. Sweet. All right. So um, let's, uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself. So I am a uh, member of the Apache Software Foundation, um, and uh, thanks to everybody for selecting me for that. Um, I am on the project management committee for Apache Cloud Spec. Uh, I was originally at cloud.com uh, before pushing to cloud cloud.com and then uh, CloudStack moved to the OSS shortly thereafter. Um, before that, I was an operations guy and I worked in uh, operations as a sysadmin or uh, team lead for about a decade. Uh, and during that time, I did a prodigiously number of open source projects like Fedora, Linux, Asana. Uh, and I currently work for Citrix in the open source business office. Um, as a disclaimer, you will see plenty of things that are clearly not the 
took the corporate bar uh, to do the Miami Beach Santa Fe event. So <clears throat> I want to explain, um, and perhaps this is, this is well known, but I think from an ops perspective, we often get um, a siloed view of the world. And so from a developer's perspective, um, here's what happens when they get, um, when they get uh, a new project that they've got in front of them to start working on. They start the project, and they go to you with pictures with some hopes of, of who you have in pictures with them. And they file a ticket to get some leases, and then they wait. Um, if it's a really big project, they may be waiting a long time. If they, um, uh, you know, let's say that they access the new fish fishing back to size for their project, um, you know, you've got to get the PO approved. Don't know how long that's going to take you to get the ticket ordered. You've got um, to place the order, uh, and the vendor's going to have to fulfill the order. And typically, I see that ranging from four to six weeks, sometimes more. Um, but then you've got the server, and they come in, and everyone's happy, uh, except then they sit in the hallway, or they sit in uh, in the server room, waiting to be racked for the table. So they have to get uh, all of the racks tabled, and that's a different department to another ticket. And then they all get tabled up, and you need network access, which is IP addresses um, uh, you're going to need perhaps uh, if it's a sprint network, you're going to need routing, you're going to need uh, firewalls, roofs, um, written. That's a completely different department, maybe two or three different departments, depending upon your size. So more tickets, more waiting. And then finally, after that, you get to go do things, if they did everything correctly and you monitor things. And uh, so I've talked to publishing companies. Uh, they have um, they already been using virtual machines pretty heavily, and their time to get a virtual machine deployed was three months. From the time a developer asks to the time it made it through all of the steps, getting firewall rules done, getting um, IP addresses handed out, and actually getting the virtual machine provisioned and then turned over to the, to the end user, three months. Um, I talked to a university who has uh, literally a different department that handles each one of these steps, and they were at they were at eight weeks to get a virtual machine deployed for them. Um, so you've essentially got this developer who's got potentially a great idea uh, and could potentially get things done in just a week waiting. So uh, summing up, <laughs> generally speaking, this is a generalization. What IT operations is providing is not what developers want. And by and large, what we see is that developers are realizing that you know, they can do some small scale stuff on their laptop. Uh, they can use things like LXC. They can use um, uh, some desktop virtualization tools and get some basic access on their own. But when they need larger scale than that, um, they simply have nowhere to go uh, inside the organization. So they go outside. Um, and it's really easy to use a micro instance that you can get for free on Amazon. It's really easy to pop down a credit card and then get that reimbursed because most of the time they're, um, their uh, management's not going to pay into it. Um, and I tend to see a lot of development managers actually running the root AWS account uh, and letting everyone in their team do that because it is so much faster for them to get things done for the business, uh, and they're able to meet their deadlines uh, without interference from operations. But I really do think that it's not just um, just the time to get things done. It actually is. Uh, it, it comes down to being active in their business. Uh, I, I think that's partly an attitude problem um, that we in operations have adopted. I think going back to the time when we lived, the, uh, the priests that people had to make supplications through the one paid uh, baptism fee, uh, we've gotten the idea that people are coming to us asking permission 
for us to get things done rather than providing a service. And, uh, and But we'll get to it when we get to it, and, and they will have to live with it. And I do not think that that's the case. The Texas Coal Authority said we could get away from that. So <coughs> what we want to do is get rid of the waiting. Uh, and what we specifically want to do is we want to automate all of the things that um, – don't need to be uh, don't need to be dealt with by individuals, and there's a lot of that. Um, we want to have automated processes that we can easily enforce, that we can build rules around, so that we're still comfortable with things, but at the same time uh, allow people to get things done uh, to to greater degree as possible. So that brings me to what is Cloud Chat. Um, from a project standpoint. The project actually has a software foundation at the top of our project there. Um, it's an infrastructure as a service platform, uh, started development in 2008, uh, had some production deployment in 2009, was released under the GPL v3 in 2010, relicensed in 2012, uh, so we have had some time there now. Um, CloudChat differs from a lot of the other infrastructure as a service platforms uh, in a couple of ways. First and foremost is focus, and the focus is different. If you look at some of the other um, some of the other platforms out there, they have a very different focus. And uh, I will tell you what I think CloudChat's focus is, at least what it is today. That may change at some point because uh, it is a living organization, living project. But uh, I think the focus of CloudChat is to have an infrastructure as a service platform that just works, that is really easy to deploy, uh, because we want to focus on uh, rapid time and value. That's one of the reasons we want a cloud uh, platform in the first place, and we want to make sure that we're, we're going to be able to um, allow you to do that. Um, so let me talk a little about the... Uh, the architecture so you understand how we're going to go about deploying this. And rather than just bore you with PowerPoints, let me briefly um, talk about how we group resources. Um, so we have this concept of a region, which you don't see up there. And a region is a collection of zones that are geographically close together. Uh, so we typically are talking um, 10 milliseconds or less is what we would really expect as far as latency. So you're, you're really talking about data centers in the same city. Um, and you would assume that a zone itself is going to be a data center or maybe even uh, you are partitioning your data center into one or more zones. Um, but the regions will, um, if you have multiple regions, and we're just not advocating that you do this for a test bed cloud, but just to set some background, uh, they use an asynchronous message bus to communicate between the regions so that you can uh, so that you don't have to deal uh, with uh, latency being an issue. You can, uh, latency is not that big a deal and go test out a cloud when you test out it. Essentially, these zones have uh, some quasi-independent management um, of each other. They, uh, uh, so each region will have its own set of uh, management servers and they'll communicate with each other. Uh, you don't necessarily have to worry about uh, management server falling off the face of the earth during a run. Um, so the zone is where we're really going to focus most of our attention today, and it's what's most relevant uh, because we would have to have at least one zone. Um, <coughs> and the zone is really where uh, you're going to be making networking decisions. So uh, at the zone level, 
zone level, we are deciding what the underlying network model for the rest of, for everything underneath is going to be. Uh, and I, I don't want to delve, jump right into networking, but uh, essentially you're going to be deciding whether you're using SDN, uh, whether you're going to be using VLANs, or you're going to do uh, layer three uh, isolation uh, like Amazon Security Group. Uh, so a zone is, is almost always within a single data center. It is a rather arbitrary distinction, uh, but because you're setting the network model, uh, it assumes that you're not going to have to own more than a single data center with the zone. The next level down are pods, and typically those are a rack or a row of racks. And uh, uh, we're essentially assuming that there is a top of rack or end of row switch, and so the guest network within a pod is all going to be the same. Uh, everything inside that pod is going to have uh, going to have access to uh, the same guest network. Below that are clusters, and this is the first time where we actually start enforcing uh, uh, enforcing some rules on this. Uh, so clusters are at the lowest level uh, that we really are making any real decisions at. Uh, so when we make deployment decisions, we make them at the cluster level. Um, and so within a cluster, the hypervisors have to be the same, the hardware needs to be sort of the same, uh, at least as far as the hypervisor is concerned. Um, because we may decide to move uh, virtual machines around within a cluster to rebalance uh, load on the machines. We may decide um, that because of a failure, we're going to restart a machine, uh, or restart an instance on another machine in the cluster. And so they need to have access to the same networking. Um, they need to probably have access to uh, the same CPU, or at least close enough that the hypervisor doesn't care and will migrate it somewhere else. Um, that said, you can have multiple types of hypervisors in a pod. So you can have a cluster of KVM, a cluster of Zen Server, and a cluster of VMware, all living in the same pod and, uh, uh, and all running along and being managed by the same uh, site management system. And of course, we have the hosts that are in the, the, uh, that are in the clusters. A couple of other elements that aren't necessarily um, uh, related to uh, just straight hierarchy. We have a concept called secondary storage. Uh, and secondary storage is effectively our object store uh, that we use for storing, um, uh, we'll use that to store snapshots of running virtual machines. And we'll also use that to store the disk images for machines that we are going to deploy. Um, and so this is uh, storage that tends to not change a lot and its contents tend to be immutable. Um, and you can do this with, if you want the, the quick and dirty route, you can set up an NFS share and use that, or you can use Swift or S3 uh, or anything that adheres to either Swift or S3 APIs. We also have primary storage, um, and there's really three different flavors of primary storage. And primary storage is where we run the actual uh, virtual machines. And uh, so there's three places, three types really. There's local storage. So you can have disks in the host themselves and provision virtual machines there. You need to understand that there are some implications like you're not gonna be able to live migrate a machine. It's gonna be fine for test bed environment. Um, you do get far better performance there, but um, uh, you know, that, that's, uh, or you tend to get far better performance, uh, depending upon the alternative, I suppose. But uh, uh, it, it also is a bit limiting in that you'll, uh, it makes um, deployment decisions a little more difficult because you're, you're now, um, it injects some additional complexity to where we used to only look at clusters uh, for deployment decisions. Now we have to go try that deployment uh, on an individual host 
make sure it has enough storage. We also have shared storage uh, that is shared at the cluster level, and this has been the default um, since probably cloud stack 1.0 is you tie primary storage to the cluster uh, for a couple of reasons. First, uh, the hypervisors tended to have uh, a lot of uh, hypervisor specific uh, desires, so uh, they wanted to have VMFS if you were running VMware. They wanted to do LVM on top of iSCSI if you were running um, KVM. Uh, or they wanted, uh, they wanted um, to run raw block devices on iSCSI uh, with Vim Circle. And so <coughs> that coupled with the fact that we wanted to limit the number of uh, units that could actually hit a single storage resource. So essentially trying to constrain the number of IOPS that would be demanded uh, on any storage resource. Uh, so we had that shared primary storage. That also meant that you could only live migrate uh, workloads within a cluster, which is limited in that case. <coughs> At the same time, storage is rapidly changing and we're seeing uh, distributed storage really starting to pick up some traction. Um, tools like Ceph, uh, particularly Ceph RDD. Uh, Gluster has um, uh, some new uh, libvirt integration uh, where people are doing uh, essentially block devices uh, as a Gluster object. And uh, tools like Sheepdog, which has actually been around a little longer, uh, that are focused on providing the types of storage that hypervisors really want to consume. And uh, being able to do that at scale, which allows them to scale out their, uh, their ability to deal with multiple uh, hypervisors. So we've got uh, the final type of primary storage is zone wide. So you can have uh, storage that is accessible from anything within a zone, i.e. anything within a data center. This is also, I think, important because it's, uh, it's essentially the same scheme that Amazon uses for EBS. Um, and if you'll notice, EBS can be accessed from anywhere within uh, availability zone within AWS. So you need to limit that, uh, that underlying architecture. So that got us through uh, talking about structure of uh, physical resources, right? Um, let's talk about some networking for a minute. Um, let's see if I still have my slides up. So this is a super simple uh, network deployment for, um, this is my personal cloud stack file that's uh, running on a Kobo in Essentially, I'm using VLANs for isolation. So um, going back real quickly, um, we want to give people the ability to go get work done without shooting themselves, us, or anyone else in the foot in the process. And so that, uh, that means that we need to provide isolation to keep people um, isolated from each other. Uh, so if you set up a MySQL uh, test instance, it does not become a production MySQL instance. Uh, other people can connect to it and uh, bring it down. And so uh, we have to assume isolation by default. And the question is, how are you going to provide that isolation? And there are really a, a number of options. Um, so the traditional answer to that is you use VLANs. Um, and people are really comfortable using VLANs uh, for network isolation. So um, it's a... Uh, proven and tested technology. Um, it's got a couple of problems. It was, it was really created in the day before we could envision anything like the shared uh, economies of scale that is uh, being put into demands on, uh, on infrastructure today. Anyone know the maximum number of VLANs in the house? Anyone out there? 4,000? 
4,096 theoretically. Um, the real problem is actually not uh, the 4,000 is not. Um, the overhead that is from routing, making routing and uh, decisions for 4,000 VLANs is incredibly expensive. Uh, and so the network vendors say, you know, no one, uh, no one in general enterprise needs to route more than about 80 VLANs. Uh, and so typically for under six figures um, US, you cannot get a switch that will do more than a thousand VLANs at a time. And you're talking hundreds of thousands or millions uh, to uh, get something that will handle at line speed 4,000 VLANs. Which creates interesting other problems because that's also a very arbitrary number um, after you've invested thousands of dollars. Uh, so there's lots of people who are doing things like VXAN, um, MV, uh, MVGRE and uh, some of the other uh, SDN technologies that people have been pushing um, and you know paying a billion dollars for Nextera which uses SDT. Um, we'll talk about those in a little bit um, but essentially uh, you should walk away with the understanding that VLANs are expensive for you to consume and that if you're using VLANs for isolation, uh, you will run out, depending upon the size of your deployment, you will run out quickly. Um, because you're essentially going to need to provide a VLAN to every single, um, uh, we'll call it an account. So we use CloudStack has a concept of user accounts. Accounts are the lowest level of isolation. Uh, and you could have multiple users within a single account. Um, but with uh, each account needing at least one, and if they need to build a multi-tier uh, uh, app and need to have multiple uh, levels of uh, network, you've got uh, them consume three, four, five, 10, 15. Uh, start multiplying that by the number of teams or accounts that you're gonna have, and that leads to quickly. <coughs> so uh, this is not a new problem. Uh, Amazon clearly had this problem and they developed something called security keys. Um, this is Linux Sun, so how many folks are familiar with DB Cable? Okay, so uh, how many folks are familiar with IP Cable? If you'd like to be that serious. Um, so IP Cable uh, has been around for a while, and uh, EB Cables is its great brother. So uh, when hypervisors create a networking device, uh, generally speaking, uh, they're doing that in pairs. So they've got the physical connector uh, that you plug uh, a cable into. And um, that gets them that network access uh, into the box, right? So you plug a cable into it and it gets them uh, the physical network into the box. And then they uh, create a bridge device and then uh, link those virtual interfaces that they're creating for the virtual machines into that bridge. Uh, and so in effect, that bridge device um, becomes uh, a national choke point or a point to make routing and firewall decisions, even though it's um, making layer three decisions rather than layer two, which you would typically get with VLANs. That also gives you some scalability though, because now instead of um, a single router or a layer three switch sitting at the um, sitting at the top of a, uh, a rack making all of those decisions. Each machine, each physical machine uh, or hypervisor that's sitting in that rack has a bridge device that can be making decisions. So effectively you federated out your, uh, your routing decisions even though you've moved them up layers. Uh, we've seen that work at massive scales, 50,000 of those bridge devices in a single deployment all being orchestrated um, by, uh, by CloudStack and essentially providing uh, that network isolation. Um, uh, and essentially what, what CloudStack's doing in that is, is ensuring that the state that is declared by CloudStack is actually enforced by the machines in a 
what you could try and say was uh, what you could have as far as uh, filtering, reset what you have, and if not, update it. Um, so it's not really a config management on the network front. You also have um, SVM options, and I'm not going to delve into those greatly. I don't think they have a ton of um, applicability to uh, test bed environments. They certainly are out there. Um, today, uh, CloudStack supports Mysteria MVP or MVS if you're using the latest uh, release. It supports um, supports just using GRE tunnels. Um, if you want to just use OpenV scripts uh, and GRE tunnels, uh, it supports driver sphere. Um, it supports MITRE Curve MITRE Net. Um, there's just been added VXLAN support that is not in the release yet, uh, and Comfed support has been is uh, being very actively worked on. It's saving the repo. Uh, but it's not bringing those initial release notes yet. So um, there are plenty of SVN options in case you're going to need that for wider use. So let me uh, pull up the Comfort Tunnel. So uh, a couple of other things that we'll talk about. Really what CloudStack does is it's making um, basic orchestration analysis easy, right? So um, when I go to deploy an instance, we're, we're doing, a, there are a number of things that we ask of the user to help us decide. And I apologize for this term. Um, real people who do work don't use this, but uh, it's helpful for illustrating things. So we tell them, we tell the end user the places they are allowed to deploy a virtual machine, right? You can do this in uh, any of the zones that you have access to. Now we may, we may have zones that, that you don't have access to, but you, you get to choose that. That's one of the things we are allowed to choose. Then we have templates that you can choose from, right? So you can choose what your disk image is going to be. Um, now, you'll notice that some of these have a hypervisor listed. Um, in reality, the end user doesn't get to choose the hypervisor. The disk image they choose may choose that for them, um, but uh, they don't inherently get to make that choice. Uh, they get to decide what they want. They shouldn't care or worry about uh, what the hypervisor is. Those are merely uh, text fields that have been added. So the end user doesn't know if they're running on bare metal, uh, if they're running on uh, a hypervisor, or if they're running in a container like the LXC. Then we just, they get to decide what kind of resources. And again, this is something that uh, the operations folks are getting to present to them. Uh, they can define a number of uh, instances or a number of offerings for those instances uh, that, and again, these are all text fields. If if we had any creativity, we would uh, we would pick something like how much CPU or how much RAM instead of medium and, and low. We also allow them to say uh, if they want additional storage in addition to the root disk, root disk image. get to choose uh, a number of things about uh, uh, connectors. And so you'll notice that for the account that I'm on now, there's a container network. I could come here and add a new network, tell you the type, etc. Essentially, uh, you know, if I'm allowed to create additional network or um, have uh, still network left in my quota, I could certainly do that. Um, but, uh, and, but I may be presented with a number of of, um, of networks. All of those 
factors go into deciding where you're going to actually allocate your team, right? Because if you choose a network that's only available uh, in a specific pod, that's going to have to be deployed there. Um, if you, there's also an entire science behind where do you want to allocate your team. Um, and so CloudStack ships with a number of allocation um, algorithms. So, uh, but a default is first come first serve. So we see your request, we'll start looking for resources, and the first resource we find that meets all of the conditions you've put on it, we will allow you to, uh, we will deploy it right there. And what that means is that every time you start searching local host, it tends to get those in the same order. So it will start showing up host first, generally. Um, <coughs> but there's also um, a number of other things. You can distribute that out. Uh, you can say, uh, you can say uh, uh, there's a distributed per account. So I want, I'm worried about uh, a machine dying, and I don't want all of the machines living on a single physical host. So I will spread out within an account machines as widely as possible. Uh, you also have um, uh, equalizing, which will essentially uh, spread the load out equally so that hosts are consumed equally. Um, and there are a number of others. You can also write your own if you, uh, if you need to apply rules of affinity and non-affinity. If you want to have um, two nodes that are processing the same data close by so that they can pass that data back and forth easily. Uh, or a number of other rules. Maybe you have um, licensing for Microsoft or Oracle products that say you can run as many instances as you want on uh, on n number of physical nodes. And so you want to keep all of those on the same physical node. Uh, so really, when it comes down to it, CloudStack is about creating a set of um, uh, of rules surrounding allocation and if you've got some defaults that you still have to do this first time out but allowing you to set uh, parameters whereby people can go and automatically deploy things and do things on the same same node um, and so we're going kind of backwards here we we talked about the architecture and we talked about what CloudStack does at a really high level um, let's talk about kind of the the layout of how CloudStack does that. So we obviously have hypervisors and we group those in clusters and pods and zones uh, and then regions. Um, but the rest of that story is that we have stateless management servers. Uh, and this is what you're seeing here is one of those management servers. Um, it, uh, It'll run on just about anything because it's all Java, but uh, we generally assume Linux uh, is what you're running it on. Um, they're stateless, they will auto dial. Um, uh, they work between themselves if you've got multiple of them. Uh, they will essentially um, uh, pick up work uh, if one of them dies. So you can have four or five of these stood up and um, it'll automatically load balance all of the work. Um, by the way, four or five is overkill. Uh, the largest deployment that I know of is um, almost at 50,000 physical hosts under a single plane of management, and they have a grand total of four management servers in the same plane. Um, so I keep saying that these are stateless, or at least quasi stateless um, uh, management servers. Dave would store it in a um, MySQL database. Got, uh, you've got your data store on the back end and then you're getting it to them. Um, that's how you do monolithic and it is uh, from that perspective. You've got sing essentially a single orchestration engine uh, that is making allocation decisions, et cetera. Even if you've got multiple of them, uh, they're, they're effectively all doing the work. Um, <coughs> we have a couple of other things that do some of those services um, some of the other services within the cloud. So we have, um, by default anyway, we ship a, uh, a virtual router. And this router offers peer-to-peer -peer DNS, um, routing firewall, NAT, 
couple of other um, network services that you can choose to turn on or off uh, as a service offering for folks. And uh, depending upon your network model, you'll have um, one per pod or one per account. Um, so if you're using VLAN, each customer ends up getting their own uh, virtual router. They don't get to access it. Uh, they can interact with PodStack to, uh, to make changes um, to the configuration, uh, but, um, uh, but they don't actually get to, to deal with that, but it is what it is again. And so it will automatically spin up uh, a new router when a new network is created. have multiple networks that are backed by a single virtual router. Um, we also have a couple of other um, pieces of functionality. So uh, you can take a pack of V-Bits just like you would take a pack of Strymon to track on a dumb machine or high low on um, uh, high low on HP or LUN on, I don't know, the Sun Hardware or something. We essentially have a remote console um, that uh, will allow you, with your networking code you just gave me the other day, to connect to the console of the virtual machine. And so we have, because we don't want to allow you direct access to the hypervisor, we have this, um, uh, we have essentially an AJAX proxy to either VMC, and we just recently got uh, a code drop to add RDP in as well. Uh, so you can connect uh, to the console of the machine from your hypervisor, and uh, this offer, just like SAS or LUN or uh, HP, how slow response is and how you take some inputs every day, but worst case scenario is it's a win. Um, this is also, especially if you're using something more than a console, this also gets a little uh, expensive in terms of proxy cache. So we have this um, console proxy VM, and it will uh, add additional nodes on demand, um, and essentially so that if, uh, if there are a ton of people accessing the console, it'll spin up more, and when that uh, load dies down, it'll drop back to just a single console proxy. We do something similar with the secondary storage VM, which deals with aging out, um, aging out uh, your um, uh, your snapshot, grabbing snapshots from the running hypervisors, uh, as well as deploying uh, templates and allowing you to to download snapshots or templates from it. So. Um, to go as deeply into what PodStack is as I have done. Before I depart though, do you have any questions about what PodStack is or how it does it before we go into actually using the server from PodStack? different things. We will interact with vCenter, um, and that assumes that you'll have VMware nodes behind it. Uh, we will interact with GenServer's API, which assumes that you'll have GenServer probably running on bare metal. Um, we'll interact with LibVirt uh, for KVM and LXP. Um, it probably assumes that you're running um, bare metal for the KVM nodes. Running the KVM or bare metal for the LXP nodes is that in, in your world? Um, but we don't really care because we're we're largely trying to do everything we can to interact with APIs rather than to interact with um, you know command line uh, as much as we can. So uh, that means that uh, we don't really care what the hosts are as long as we can talk to them and let them know. 
we do do some version checks. Um, so if you're not on, if you're trying to run uh, a really old version of lead center or a really old version of uh, Sim Server or Libvirt, um, we'll fail any internet that uh, has a host. But really, we don't care what people say. Um, uh, as long as they, uh, we do some checks for uh, ensuring that you can do hardware burst on the on the host, uh, especially for KVM Sim Server. Aside from that, we don't we don't care what they say. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Uh, let me see if I. Guest networks are pod-wide. Networking uh, in general is domain-wide. So uh, we would assume that uh, your pod has, your pod may have access only to um, specific guest networks. Those could be larger, but uh, the pod is going to assume that everything in the pod has access to the same guest network. It may be that everything in the zone does, but that's not a guarantee. And certainly the, the network doesn't, um, uh, portable IP stuff, not super friendly. Um, uh, we assume that, uh, uh, that networks are not uh, crossing the guest boundary. Talk about what a self-service guest test cloud looks like. Um, I think self-service is mandatory. Uh, it's certainly in uh, most of the definitions of ar around cloud. Um, and I don't think you can get away uh, from allowing people to provision their own things. If you're just looking for a brand new toy, uh, there are much better projects to tackle than an infrastructure as a service. talk a little bit about setting boundaries in a bit because I know that uh, that allowing people to, to self-service is awfully scary um, and as an ops guy I um, for a number of years um, including up to about 12 months before I started working on a cloud project I was vehemently against cloud computing people um, developers don't understand the depth of care about the nuances of running operations We'll talk a little bit about uh, how we deal with self-service. Um, I think you have to have um, usage measurement because when people think that they're a manager, uh, resources they will consume are um, in, uh, as if it's really their own limitations and costs. We talked about isolating a little bit earlier. I think that the guest test environment must isolate. Uh, CloudStack will allow you to uh, share networks with everyone. I think it's uh, generally prudent in our state to do that. Um, I also take um, the standpoint that, especially with dev tests, but with cloud in general, that it should be commodities. If you are having to pay inordinate amounts for specific technology, um, I think that you're, you're probably doing it wrong. Um, there would have to be a really compelling reason to pay more than than um, than the cheap stuff. Um, and I, this final thing is uh, dev test clouds should never stay dev tests. Um, uh, my favorite, uh, there's a, a movie company in uh, in California who did a, uh, a proof of concept for CloudStack. They set it up, they started using it, they liked it. Decided that they were going to uh, deploy CloudStack with the customer, and uh, so they got ready to tear down the environment. They had learned a few things. They wanted to improve uh, some of their choices, and they started to tear it down. They put on notice out, and people said, "Wait, you can't do that. We have so much workload to run here. We realize the ten page of our movie studio is running on your new cloud, along with all of our interactive properties." And 
process had been up for 90 days uh, as a proof of concept. So um, be very cautious about um, the fact that we tend to treat test beds like they're rotating step ties and, and we don't monitor and we don't, um, we don't do uh, all the things we would for a real production uh, environment uh, because when developers find out what we eat, they bypass all of the other things that we find to support a production environment, uh, which is really uh, an encouragement that we need to be uh, communicating and be familiar with what those three reasons are for. So <coughs> um, I showed you the flooring of, of Rachel Green, and uh, I do not believe that producing manually, um, specifically not producing by just staggering our volume, um, it could be completely automated. Uh, and this is not not being used for ELM and ops. Uh, we've had issues with uh, installers that kick start or jump start uh, or RIS for um, decades, and there is no reason for anyone to be sending out CD9 and DLC bags to install things. When you're talking, though, about, um, about letting people who have traditionally not operate, uh, self-service takes on a different meaning and use, and automation takes on a new meaning. Um, do you mean letting them use the UI? Um, like I stepped through the six steps to provisioning of ELM in the five stack UI? Well, certainly I hope not. That would mean that you have to do it more than once. Um, you want to put, even if you're using all default parameters, you want to put six times. Um, that's, uh, that's awesome. Um, no one who does real work does it this way. So um, I wouldn't let your users either. Um, maybe they want to uh, interact with an API. They've got some tools. Um, the cloud stack has a dedicated command line um, interface called Cloud Monkey that's on PyHive. So you can install it from PyHive. Um, that will allow you to uh, have essentially tab spacing for deploying for doing anything with CloudStack. Um, uh, CloudStack also has a native API uh, that you can interact with directly. You can use extraction libraries. Um, CloudStack also maintains um, EC2 compatibility. So we have a separate API interface. Uh, if you want to use tools like Proto or user tools, um, or even Amazon EC2 tools, although that violates the um, the license around the EC2 tools themselves. Uh, you can interact with the um, CloudStack EC2 interface and um, and use the same tools for doing that. Um, I think if you have really sophisticated developers, uh, that any of those options are probably realistic. Um, I think there's also config management deployment. Uh, anyone in here not using config management? Okay. Anyone just afraid to raise their hand? Um, uh, so config management is is well entrenched today. Um, and I'll show you my favorite tool. And I apologize for this being so small because you know how to get everything in there uh, easily otherwise. So. <coughs> Here we have the name. This is of the deep cluster definition. This is uh, this is for a tool called Nice Cloud Stack. Uh, how many folks are familiar with Chef or Nice? Okay, so for those of you who aren't, uh, Chef is a config management tool uh, from Opstage, and Nice is uh, essentially their pr provisioning tool. Um, at least that's what we're using it for here. Uh, nice Cloud Stack has um, a unique ability to define. Uh, an entire application stack, uh, and then to call that. So um, uh, this is just setting the name, a description, a version number, uh, so you can keep the keep it version and update. Uh, you can set environment, but the real meat of this is when you get down to deployment. So we have uh, we have zookeeper nodes here, and we've defined that there will be three of them in this application stack, A, B, and C. 
we define what the base distance is going to be, which is the gel fiber is the base. And you'll notice that we use that throughout in all three of these sections. The service offering, uh, which again is the CPU and RAM that it's going to have. Port rules are the firewall rules that we're adjusting to open. Um, and then we're essentially defining the roles that it's going to have. So this is going to be a member of cluster A and it's going to be a zookeeper server within that cluster. So that's just defined three nodes for us. Then we're going to have a Hadoop mastery. Um, you'll notice the service offering is different. Uh, you'll also notice that this has a, a network to it. So um, that gives you app, uh, app storage network. Uh, and so it's adding both of those. You'll see we're also opening up three, uh, three different sets of ports. And then finally, we're coming down and uh, having the worker nodes, uh, which again are using RHEL 5.6, same service offering, um, port rules. You'll notice we didn't define any, um, any network between the three. This is going to contain the default network. So this is something that operations defined as, this is what a Hadoop cluster looks like in our environment. A developer sits there and says, nice, CF, SAT, uh, Hadoop cluster A deploy. And it deploys all of these machines um, with the firewall rules applied, uh, access to the proper network, and, um, uh, and then links them all together as that cluster. Um, so rather than, you know, simply, provisioning a um, uh, raw virtual machines and then having to install Hadoop and then having to configure network access, um, the ops folks said, hey, this is how we define a Hadoop cluster in our environment. Go use this. Um, and it's a single command line from the developer that deploys our entire cluster in terms of configuring the node again. Uh, and the folks at admins.com wrote that for you um, and uh, I've been very pleased with it. You can do similar things like this with um, uh, salt stack. Um, uh, there's folks who are working on it for Ansible and um, there's similar stuff for uh, probably a native package provider for uh, public resources or for cloud-cap resources for some of these as well. Um, what I tend to see, this is again perfectly viable Thing. What I tend to see though uh, most often is people have a tool and this ranges from a button uh, on a web page uh, to something like this. Um, this is uh, Cloudcat uh, written by the folks at Cloudera um, and this is essentially how their developers are deploying uh, CloudStack. Um, <coughs> get to a set of few things, there are defaults for virtually everything, and you know, they can say, send me that picture to make uh, this thing. Um, the only other thing that I tend to see is, I uh, see a lot of people uh, doing local agents. Um, so a developer, particularly in a dev test cloud, should not be running for that thing forever. Uh, it should have a limited lifespan, and so essentially um, creating a record of how long are you promised to, uh, to use and be, then be done with it uh, and then harvesting based upon those records uh, is, uh, is something I see through commonly as well. So how many folks are familiar with Jeff's Paradox? All right, so uh, before you go to Wikipedia, Jeff's Paradox says uh, essentially that as we become more efficient, that demand for what we just made efficient goes up. Um, uh, because uh, because we can produce uh, electricity cheaper, uh, we will consume more of it. Um, when gas, when petrol is, uh, is less expensive, people tend to drive farther. Um, and so when, uh, <coughs> when it is much easier to consume compet competing resources, people will. Uh, and on top of that, because there's the no direct 
uh, car, people are often leaving um, uh, leaving AWS and just running uh, out of some options. Um, and I say that as someone who's had you know two thousand dollars a month AWS bills on my personal AWS account because other people in my team have gone up into the suite and left them running. I was getting no direct benefit and just being charged for it. So uh, there's plenty of ways that tip layers around and you need to either have a chargeback or a showback mechanism. Um, and so CloudStack will actively calculate um, your usage and it will do that not just for allocated resources, but it will actually look at percentage. So you may have a five terabyte disk allocated that uh, 50, 50 gigabytes of that is actually consumed and it will track both of those disks. Um, uh, same thing with CPU. You may have um, four vCPUs consumed or allocated and only consume one of them at 100%. Uh, and so you can actually look at the things that are going unused uh, that are still in your allocation. Um, and you would be shocked at how uh, effectively that, um, that cordons off a lot of data because um, uh, engineering managers do put their responsible for 25% of the compute bill and um, and things start to uh, be on edge. Um, <coughs> so I think you also need to deal with monitoring. Um, I do not think, and, and I think Tom Lemoncelli is the, the guy who first said this, uh, that you cannot offer a service if you do not monitor. Um, it simply is not a service if you, if you don't care enough to monitor. same time, I think from an operations standpoint, um, why monitor? Just say. Uh, we've already established that uh, we don't care enough and it may go away. Um, <coughs> so uh, that said, uh, even though we are the high and mighty operations folks, it's still, it's still important to say a little bit of operations stuff. Um, uh, so uh, you know, I think at a minimum, monitoring cloud stack because I think it will become uh, an important tool or monitoring whatever your cloud stack stuff is, is a reasonable start. Um, I don't think I would necessarily monitor an instance of um, Cloudstack. But uh, the more important question is how are you going to deal with ephemeral events? So think about what we typically do. How many folks are using IBS for monitoring? Um, so typically what we do is we define what we're going to monitor on our nodes. And um, that means that when we spin it up, we will say, all right, HTTPD is running here. We will monitor that. Um, MySQL is running on this other box. We have a different set of tests we will run for that. What about if you don't know when a host comes up or down? What happens when um, it goes up or a developer kills it? Does someone get woken up in the middle of the night? That's a question that you have to, uh, you know, is that worth alerting on? I would argue that it's not, but you also have to be able to monitor those resources to make sure. So I think you need to be choosing commodities there. Um, if I were designing a, a test dev uh, environment today and I wasn't already paying NetApp or EMC or some other storage vendor large sums of money, I would certainly be doing local storage. Yeah. CloudStack has, um, will send you out SMMP class. You can also do JMX uh, for monitoring CloudStack itself. Uh, you know, there's JMX support that allows you to do a ton of things. Um, there are monitoring packages or monitoring plugins for Mobius, uh, Zeno, Zabbix, and Nimsoft uh, that actually are making API calls into CloudStack for uh, monitoring things like host availability and um, uh, and um, amount of storage that you have to run, et cetera, for your entire environment. Um, uh, so I think those are, that's a step you're gonna bump today. Um, much to my chagrin, CloudStack doesn't have um, an SMMP annotation for storage, which is kind of something that I want. Uh, so it'll send out alerts, but it won't, it won't do anything past that. Um, 
and uh, we've really struggled with trying to keep the cloud itself from becoming a moniker environment itself. Um, uh, it does some very limited monitoring of, uh, of the storage resources we consume, the networking resources we consume. Um, but really, it's just a sea of tiny uh, traces of DUI on those resources. We'll also check case um, we use marks that are timely available. Uh, we'll, we'll check those hosts to make to see if they are still up, and uh, if they're not, we'll restart them on a different host. But uh, it's just really limited in terms of the checks we make. It's not HA in the sense that um, Tor stands for limit, but uh, it's probably much better to be around Linux. Um, it's uh, I tried to pitch this long before uh, back when we were at cloud.com. Uh, of calling it uh, really fast and time for recovery rather than HA, but apparently they found that was a uh, marketing ploy. So, um, uh, from a monitoring perspective, uh, you can scrap the crap, uh, you can um, do very much monitoring with your your big data crops, maybe you've done already, and um, uh, you can also go with Mingo plugins, you can emulate this and make essentially any kind of a system for checking the API of that cloud system. So, when I'm if I'm assembling a uh, a um, dev test cloud, I personally think that the best value is local storage, because <coughs> I'm I'm essentially saying that I don't need something that has the attributes of shared storage. I need it to um, be relatively fast. Local storage tends to be uh, generally the fastest. Um, it's not resilient. I know that if it dies, it goes away. And I have hopefully set up such hosts that all of these uh, should be treated as the same elements, even if they're not. Um, so you don't get fail over. If the host dies, all that storage goes with it. But, um, but it's best and most uh, cheap and performant and able to get you started right away. So I talked a lot about kind of the networking strategy. If I were defining a network for a dev test cloud, I would be uh, choosing layer three isolation, what Amazon calls security groups. I think that uh, you can do VLANs on a really small scale, um, but I don't honestly think it's worth it. Uh, I don't think, uh, particularly on a dev test cloud, that there's anything that you can miss out on um, by using layer three isolation. You can use the key capabilities, um, uh, switches, and switches that aren't even capable of VLANs uh, if you're using security groups. Um, Cloud Sentinel, and I didn't really talk about this, Cloud Sentinel will manage um, physical hardware or even virtual representations of physical hardware. So if you've got um, F5 load balancer or Juniper SRS or um, uh, Cisco has a number of uh, virtual network appliances that you can use with VMware. Um, you can have Cloud Sentinel interact with all of those. Uh, I think it's a waste of your money um, for the dev test scope. Um, I do not think, and I think for a lot of other parts of the segment, you really have to get uh, into a very niche uh, deployment for dev silos. So. The virtual routers will be v will be VLANs, load balancing, port forwarding is not, um, and uh, a number of services is probably the next move. Uh, let them do the work. Uh, a virtual machine is as commodity as you can get. Um, <coughs> and this also allows you to, uh, depending upon your network uh, deployment, allows you to scale it to easily. Adding another virtual router is as easy as adding another another virtual machine. Uh, so I, I, would, uh, I would use cheap networking gear, um, and I would use layer three isolation as my network model when setting this up. So then when, um, then when going for hypervisor, I pick a choice here. Um, that is my personal choice. You can use whatever you're accounting for because you'll already have the expertise. Um, use what, what everyone knows. If you're a VMware child, 
doing this. You're already paying to be in their account. There's zero benefit difference. Um, and for from a dev tech perspective, there is zero benefit in using an uh, API that's not exist. Useless to note. Um, from a dev tech perspective, they are they are effectively useless. Uh, you need the ability to turn a virtual machine on, off, ensure it gets connected to a, um, a network that has access to storage, and every hypervisor out there does a great job with that. If you are um, if you are incredibly resource constrained, though you're doing this at a really large scale, um, there are two different answers. Uh, I think KVM, if you come in knowing nothing, um, you're going to be running Linux regimes anyway. Uh, so I think KVM is the easiest to test if you don't know hypervisors at all. Um, and it's the easiest to get going and running uh, really quickly. Uh, to squeeze the most out of things, I think uh, Zen Server probably gets you close to that. And I think that's why you see uh, Google and Amazon, uh, both of their clouds are running on Zen-based hypervisors. Uh, I think they allow you to tweak things. I think the overhead for doing so uh, is a lot higher. Um, but um, but if you're doing this at massive scale or you've got to eat every bit out of a performance out of it or you need to um, you need to pass through virtual CPUs for um, for uh, actually using the CPU uh, calculations, yeah, there's there's probably some advantages of Zen. Uh, but for general dev tech purposes, uh, useless to know. Uh, if you're really resource constrained, uh, LX2 is far more efficient than any of the real hypervisors. Uh, LX2 is uh, just a container. Uh, and uh, I think LX2 is compelling for other reasons from a dev tech environment, the entire uh, container aspect of being able to deform define the environment. Um, I think it makes it easier on folks. But if you're not already using LX2 or Docker or something similar, um, it may not be worth the overhead of knowing. Anyone find my Twist KVM a pain point? I don't know if it's probably just Citrix or Zen. Um, the Citrix uh, does a lot of work on Zen, and uh, I suspect Docker would too. So. standpoint, we, we like the idea of not having to do manual tasks and being able to automate them. We dislike the idea of people having uh, essentially uh, the authority to go and do things that we consider dangerous for them to do. Um, so we have a couple of constructs and, and every cloud management uh, platform that you have to look at. You can limit the amount of resources that people can deploy. You can limit where they can deploy resources. Um, and uh, you can create a number of rules for yourself. Um, anyone know what the default limit is for number of instances on AWS? I'm sorry, I should have said that. 20, you can spin up 20 VMs. Um, the last uh, estimate that I heard was that uh, Amazon has well under six figures of physical host which I would be willing to bet is larger than any of the uh, cloud deployments that any of us will do in our active state. And I think Amazon does it for a couple of reasons. Um, I don't think that they necessarily have a scale problem, but I think they, they are um, concerned about it somewhat. Um, they're worried about fraud, and they're also worried about um, uh, inadvertent uh, escalation of bills that people will end up not being able to pay. So <coughs> essentially um, um, with when you're talking about uh, deploying um, all of these uh, resources and maybe even attempting to auto scale uh, based on load, spinning up 20, well that's, that's a heavy use spinning up 200 or 2,000 uh, because it ran away from you without you knowing, uh, that's a lot more scary. So when even the, the largest uh, public cloud in the world has uh, some default limits, 
think it's uh, not unreasonable for you to have a claim. So um, accepting defaults, um, there are ways of getting around. You know, if you've got a big project and, and need to have multiple people uh, sharing resources um, outside of the account system, uh, you can set up projects that allocate resources directly to that to get yourself around um, around quotas. And the quotas will ensure that 90% of the time, maybe 95% of the time, you stay out of people's way and allow them to work within same uh, same restrictions. And those people that uh, that are going to need to continue on will have to do so. That allows you to deal with um, uh, setting, you know, you may set, uh, it may be a pain in your environment to say that people get removed because they have to do with it because you don't want them to stay too long. Um, and uh, allows you to still make exceptions that allow uh, different people to do very similar things. So I've told you my consideration. I want to talk about how you actually go about deploying uh, private cloud. Um, so what I won't talk about is deploying the cloud. Uh, CloudSec has Yum and app repos, so if you're using um, Ubuntu, Debian, or uh, CentOS, you can deploy easily um, with two lines to build your own packages if you want to run it on something other than CentOS or Ubuntu, the Ubuntu library um, distribution. Uh, so that really is the easy part of the deployment. Um, so how do you actually go about and deploy cloud stack uh, in your environment? And uh, that's actually a couple of things. Uh, so uh, you're obviously going to install the packages. Um, that's, again, the boring part we don't want to talk about. You have the things that, uh, uh, that you also have to take care of. You've got to decide network size. And invariably, you will get it wrong the first time you try and deploy something. Um, and I don't have any advice other than to try different things, figure out what you actually need out of the network uh, model, whether that's, you know, we're going to use VLANs uh, for whatever reason, we're going to use security groups, uh, we're going to try to pull in the SDN stuff, um, and even then, once you made the network model for it, <coughs> figuring out how to actually put that onto the, um, uh, meld that with the proof of work structure can be challenging. So let's talk about, um, we, f we focused a lot of time on network choices for, uh, for the guests. So we talked about VLAN security groups and, and SDN. Um, there's, a, there's also a management network, um, and it's, it's a data So we also have a couple of other um, we have a couple of other uh, networks that you have to worry about in the cloud. So you probably have a public network, you're going to allow people to expose their work to uh, the internet. Um, that's probably going to be a different loyalty network, even if you're using security groups. Um, and uh, the bulk of what we've talked about thus far is the guest network. Um, so while you could probably consolidate, you've also got to worry about a management network. And that management network is going to um, uh, do traffic between the hypervisor and the management server, uh, and potentially the management server and secondary storage, uh, as well as hypervisor and secondary storage. You can eliminate a little bit of that and have a separate storage network, and I, I hate the term that we call this a storage network. Uh, that is a secondary storage network. So essentially it's taking um, 
this template and fat thought and giving their stories and, and migration a dedicated network so you're not calling the Jeff network for traffic. Um, storage and management will all be the same network uh, if you don't put a, a dedicated uh, storage network in place. <coughs> and then completely separate to this, you can have a dedicated storage network for primary care. Um, and that, uh, that really is outside the scope of cloud stack and it should be set up so that the routing table sees that as the local route and storage and it will consume the, that uh, particular network. But that's really outside the scope of, of cloud stack today uh, and is more of a hidden configuration. all of these networks uh, and you've got to really figure out are these real physical interfaces um, is it worth having a dedicated um, primary storage network uh, interface should that be a this etc so um, uh, network setup is the bane of every uh, platform it will jar up the platform uh, it is the most complicated uh, piece of the puzzle I think um, but I'll essentially, I'm going to walk you through the choices that you have to make uh, when you're setting up, and, and really you're talking about setting up here in a day, right? So when you install uh, the management server is installed automatically, uh, you'll tell it what database server to point to, and it will create the database and the management server. Um, and then you'll tell it to start the management server. And then we're really coming down to uh, uh, the setting up a day, right? So everything after that is really set up. So let's walk through what setting setup looks like. Uh, and so we have um, this network choice as a basis is uh, layer three isolation, advanced is everything else. So if you want to do VLANs or SVN or security groups with VLANs, it's going to be an advanced network. Uh, and basis is either layer three isolation or no isolation at all. So we'll walk through. Um, we're setting up uh, essentially uh, trying a lot of tech today. Main uh, is setting up uh, external DNS and internal DNS. So internal DNS is the DNS that will um, that will point to local resources that they typically are not uh, publishing public DNS for us. I typically, because of the way I, I do not use any internal DNS names at all. Uh, so I list internal DNS as public DNS names. So it's there. You'll see it asks what hypervisor you have. And I told you earlier that hypervisors are um, <coughs> are uh, cluster specific. So why is it asking you for hypervisor? Um, Essentially, it's going to start creating some jobs as soon as we create the zone, and it's going to uh, it's going to need to know what hypervisor we're going to have first, so it can deploy some of those system VMs, uh, so the um, virtual routers and and other things. So. Breaking our own Google DNS server. Here we are. Now you'll notice that LXC wasn't on the list, and uh, you cannot deploy LXC as a primary zone because it does not have a system VM. So if you're using LXC, you have to run it in addition. Well, so we have uh, we have something called SysCloud, which runs the system VM services on the management server. If you're using doing really small scale stuff or just prototyping, um, but generally speaking, you need a KVM event server or VMware cluster um, running, and that's true for both bare metal and LXC. They need uh, they need 
ليك تحفظ الطرف الاخر او الطرف الاخر في مجال بالنسبه to um, uh, network options and so um, this is this is the option in some of the spaces um, and there are some others um, in some of the advanced uh, the default shared network offering with security group service is um, uh, is essentially layer three isolation you can say default shared network offering without security group and uh, and that will give you a flat layer two network that everyone shares and everyone can see what's happening on it. Um, I think that's I think that's generally a bad idea, but you can do it. And uh, you can also use NetSphere to help there as well if you want. So we're going to use security group. also say if this is going to be a public zone or not. Um, so you can create dedicated zones for specific purchases of specific users. And we see a lot of, um, a lot of government users who uh, create uh, dedicated zones for different security vendors. Um, and you can also define whether you're going to have local storage and um, zones. where you're essentially um, uh, setting up your, uh, your networking and you can add that secondary storage network and you can edit the details of uh, this network by essentially telling it uh, what the interface name is and the security name um, or uh, the label that you would have and then the interpreter or the, um, the vSwitch ID and DNA. Essentially, we're done with zone setup at this point. So let's, um, we're gonna get into our first pod. Again, it's kind of, it's a generally a wrap or way of wrap. And we will say that reserved system gateway. So this is, um, <coughs> this is uh, essentially the management network that's going to be used uh, in that pod. This is the gateway for, I'm sorry, the yes network in that pod. This is the gateway that's going to exist. We are, we are assuming that the underlying yes network has a gateway out. Um, I really dislike the fact that they call it reserved just for that particular bit on this one. And the net map, and we'll say that this is um, function three. So you need to have um, a number of ICs internally um, that are going to be reserved and dedicated to um, that are going to be reserved and dedicated to um, to cloud cache internal use. So um, think about uh, the system VMs. They're going to have a address on this guest network, and cloud cache wants you to reserve and take that use. So that also means that. Uh, so I told it that net map, but that's our class 23 um, cloud cache is going to assume is its own. Um, you could do some partitioning of that um, uh, via the API, but in this setup dialog, uh, if you hand it a network, it assumes that it has rights to everything except for that gateway, and uh, and it will also hold separately the um, the system IP address. So. Um, the install guide says that you can reserve 10. I don't know whether 10 is the number. Uh, 10 is a decent number uh, for some environments. Um, if you're using um, VLANs, it should be 10 plus the number of VLANs that you plan on consuming. Um, if you're using uh, layer three isolation, 10 probably overkill and you can get by with 10. 
some of those with some more uh, more IP as far as it can be taken from there. But we're going to do this. You'll notice this is still in my net now. So I've said uh, 10, 4, 1, 1, 2, 6, 12 is my, uh, is my system IP range. Uh, so these are going to be where the, the system VMs get their In this particular case, because I'm doing because I'm doing uh, basic networking, I will be using the same exact um, uh, network definition, and I I will not be able to use two through twelve uh, as uh, as part of my guest network. Uh, guest and uh, and system networks and basic networks are exactly the same, and I'm advocating that you use this. A, because it's simple, or it's simpler. If you're using VLANs for IP, you can define a completely different um, uh, network uh, from an IP perspective uh, to be used for each one of those VLANs. So um, you could have something completely different here, um, but we're doing basic, so it's all going to be So it's already selected that I'm going to be choosing JVM hypervisor. We're done with pod setup at this point. We're working on clusters now. Um, and so the cluster name is informative. Um, so we'll name the cluster name JVM forum. And now it's going to ask me to put my host and subnet name. Um, go through all of this and have to hear me say host hosting issue username is host password um, host tags are something that allow you to set um, individual hosts off so um, if you need to make additional allocating decisions you can say um, these are hosts with SSD these are hosts with say like vDrive um, also uh, uh, tag them and say these are um, hosts that I want to allow um, personal information about individuals to reside on as opposed to residential hosts. Generally in a uh, guest cluster environment you don't need to worry about it and you certainly don't have to say that about salt. So it's going to go and find looking for a secondary storage resource and the fault is in FS and it's an FE project so Resources included in those here anyway, but um, this is fine. It says fail. It creates go through and create the networks and and everything else, which is purely a software construct at this at this stage in the game. Um, it's also checked 
we need to reset to make sure that he's got something that will actually work uh, when it comes up. Um, so I'm just going to go through a number of things. Check your um, uh, check all of the configuration values, and then if you've made any errors, we can go back and fix the error. do make some improvements. Um, they're really easy to go fix it. And you'll see that um, that I fixed the error. Something went wrong. I remember this actually does not need to be here. Let's fix that. Um, and that's about it. At the same time, I don't want to trivialize setting up a, a cloud platform because it can be quite, uh, quite painful. Um, especially if you're trying to do more complex things. So notice I did not uh, change the default for network configuration. And you can do many more complex things and you may need to do more complex things to deal with compliance issues uh, in your environment. Um, but if you get something up that works with DevTech, um, it is just not that easy. And, and I would expect that you would spend about the two hours that we uh, almost spent here doing it, um, assuming you can provision your Linux machines uh, and hypervisors relatively quickly, uh, it should be about that easy. So <coughs> to jump back to um, I'll leave you with this, which is where you can go to get uh, to get help when you start on your uh, your cloud project. So, CloudTrack docs are there um, uh, at cloudtrack.apache.org/docs. Uh, we have an install guide, an admin guide, uh, release notes with every release, and we also have some uh, networking support and stuff. Um, IRC. There are a ton of people who are running. CloudTrack into production and have several codes on the same problems that you have, as well as a ton of developers in our uh, in our Apache CloudTrack and our CloudTrack Help Dev. Um, and so, if I were having problems, that would be the first place that I would go to. Um, and uh, um, obviously, just the website. There's a book um, put out by Packet uh, about CloudTrack. It is generally it is largely a rehash of the concepts in the install guide. Um, so uh, don't know that there's a huge uh, additional increase in, in value there. Um, and if you want to talk about CloudTrack today, there's a CloudTrack booth and uh, some of the folks from Jason Reed, uh, who are a CloudTrack consultant, who are there. Um, there are some folks from Kubert Phillips who run CloudTrack in production uh, who are there. Uh, as well as a number of folks who actually actively work on the project. Um, what questions have I not answered yet? Uh, let me turn that around. If I if I handed you a USB stick with um, with software, CloudTrack software on it, and a bunch of machines, do you think you could go and get it installed and? Actually, it's a relatively easy part. Buy the Yarn install CloudTrack. Um, it doesn't take very long, but do you think that there's enough context here to actually go and get this stuff? And if not, what kind of things? Silent, so I did either a wonderful job or everyone's asleep or I just can't figure it out. What hypervisor were you using? Okay. <coughs> so, if you actually read the documentation, um, they talk about defining 
physical interfaces um, and setting them up and getting them edited and kind of fired and that kind of thing. So it talks about, oh, you're going to have multiple VLANs on the same interface. So create all of these bridge interfaces. Um, and then it tells you to go do all of this stuff for each bridge. And then you have to go in the manage configure and do that. That is a configuration possibility. Um, I don't think that it serves you a ton of good, particularly, and again, coming back to the dev tech defense, um, there's a guide, and I have not published it yet for Core 1. Um, the quick install guide. And it is, I think when printed out, including front matter and index, it's 20 pages. So it is configuring libvirt. Install docs do talk about things that you can do. They are, in my opinion, overly complex because some people do actually want to have um, to span multiple bits on a single interface, so they want to have multiple interfaces um, sometimes bonded together. And the install documentation goes to great lengths to allow you to do anything you possibly could do, which I think makes it very hard for people to, to actually get up and going up front. Um, I would try and use the quick install guide. Um, the, the only material difference with the one that's published for core one is these things have to change. And so it's cloud stack in front of everything now rather than cloud. Um, but otherwise, um, you should be able to sit down with this guide and, and get a running cloud stack install in, in a matter of a single install. Yeah, a single node. But you get a single uh, management server and a hypervisor running on the same machine and working. Um, you should be able to do that in a matter of minutes with this install guide. And larger packet sets for the same machine. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, matter of fact, uh, like this that it you know has name uh, you're you're uh, essentially establishing that it's going to be present or absent if you need to refer it if you need to see the change to absent um, you can tell it what's saying uh, flavor is the service offering uh, and uh, image is the uh, name of the template that you're deploying uh, and you can I'm using brute but you can also use um, uh, some other settings uh, data that's, that's communicated to it as well that uh, batch are uh, to act to use cloud stack as a, uh, an EMC. Um, there's actually, if you'll look on my SlideShare account, which is slideshare.net slash KE4CCC, there's a presentation about, um, about uh, doing 
um, using puppet provision processing tricks and uh, then We were defining two different types of machines. I did that very simply. You can also define uh, firewall rules and a number of other things. Um, the bastard to uh, the sorry, file stack um, contributor here in Europe uh, lives in Geneva. Uh, he wrote similar stuff to Salt, uh, and I heard one of the uh, the three guys said that they were working on it in the fourth. So um, most of the uh, most of the management cases are covered already very quickly. Anything else I can answer for you? Um, feel free to come talk to me or visit the file stack booth. There are uh, tons of knowledgeable folks around. Um, find us on IRC. You can find me on Twitter or feel free to email me. So uh, I appreciate your attention. We're at five minutes still. Uh, we'll cut us loose and that way we can get them on. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, appreciate your time.